Even the smallest class of god machine is still an enormous power in Warhammer 40k. Let's talk about the speed and might of the Warhound Scout Titan on the battlefields of the 41st millennium. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, where today I thought it would be fun to take a look at the Warhound Scout Titan's datasheet for Warhammer 40k, take a look over the unit, compare its weapons, and talk about how it might be best to put one of these titans on the tabletop. In the lore, the Warhound Titan is essentially a scout class of titan, often used to probe enemy lines, or maybe as the flanking element of a titan legion, and it's built a bit differently from the great big tall ones, having a more hunched over and canine kind of appearance, as opposed to the slightly more humanoid shapes of the larger ones. It feels maybe a little bit similar with the relation between Knight Armagers and Questorus Knights, and Chaos Abhorrence and War Dogs. Despite being a slightly smaller titan though, they are still a titan, they're all but unvulnerable against everything but the heaviest weapons that the enemy can bring to bear on them, and they can certainly punch up and threaten enemy super heavies with their mighty turbo laser destructor if deployed with them. For the full scale 4 to old kit for Warhammer 40k, the full price is around £530 or 814 US dollars. As with a few of the other titans, they have a system where you buy the body as one bit and then the gun separately. The Warhound Titan has two different variants, the Mars pattern more imperial looking one that you can see on the right, and then the Fallen Chaos Warhound on the left, inset with the 8 pointed star. Always pretty crazy prices when you look at big centerpiece Forge World type miniatures, but a pretty cool centerpiece to have to a collection. I've certainly seen a few people 3D print sort of similar lookalikes as an alternate route to getting a big and shooty stompy robot. One thing I did quite like about the Forge World official version though are the Princeps pilot type things that they have, a cockpit area that isn't really normally going to be on show, but it's kind of fun that they still exist. I quite like the differences between the Imperial version where it's very much a pilot command centre and the Chaos version where it looks like kind of horrific things have happened to all involved with crewing the beast. They look like they're fused with its demonic machine spirit. Getting onto rules and in game in Warhammer 40k it costs 1100 points to put a Warhound Titan in your army and you're allowed to run this thing as either Imperial or Chaos. The rules in the Adeptus Titanicus Forge World download say that you're allowed to ally one Titan into a normal army of Warhammer 40k, though quite a lot of the time when these guys hit the table it tends to be for more big fun apocalypse style games with loads of ridiculous stuff on either side. At least theoretically though, at 1100 points you could bring this one to a competitive 2000 point game if you want to, all the other titans cost too much for that, being literally over 2000 points just for one model, so you could have some sort of weird quirky list where you have an enormous titan and then a bunch of supports to help it out. This is the datasheet for the Warhound Titan, some pretty big and massive stats as you'd expect for this kind of points cost, so let's take a look through each section one by one. First up for its core stat line, the Warhound moves 14 inches and it gets that super heavy walker special rule that the Imperial Knights make and that one means that if you make a normal advance or fallback move it can move other models excluding titanic models and also step over terrain features and things that are less than 4 inches in height. It does mean that it's pretty rapid to move across the table and you could move it over half the way into the midboard if you really wanted to, should be able to get some lines of sight I suppose. As despite having the towering keyword, they changed that in the core rules towards the start of the edition. Now towering only means that you basically ignore the obscuring type ruins rule for things that you just tow into, but still other ruins might be able to block its line of sight, and with a big titan with only direct fire weapons and very powerful ones, that could be quite a big consideration. Otherwise though, its defensive stats are understandably enormous, toughness 13, a 2 plus save with a 5 plus invulnerable saves, and then a massive 40 wounds. A really intimidating profile if your opponent does try and take that down, though at least comparatively it doesn't look enormously stand out for the cost, at least when you weigh it up against say its weight in say Imperial Knight datasheets. He does have an enormous objective control 16, which means that if he's towing onto an objective it's probably yours unless the opponent has excessive amounts of troop type models, should hold one point on the board really quite convincingly. For toughness, for a rough sort of scope of what sort of firepower it would take to bring this guy down, it's an average around about 40 last cannon hits to take one out, though I guess you could argue that maybe last cannons are a bit suboptimal against it, they're only strength 12 versus toughness 13, so perfectly placed to wound on a 5+, plus. at least comparatively for their points, melter guns or anything that's strength 14 or more will disproportionately be good compared with last cannons. For comparison to something that's maybe a little bit more often taken in normal 40k, the Imperial Knight Castellan profile it's pretty much the same defensive profile, toughness 13, a 2 plus save, and a 5 plus invulnerable against range. 
and that one gives you 24 wounds with a feel no pain for 565 points. It does mean that if you compare it against the Knight Castellan, the Knights really are quite a lot more durable per point. It takes 56 last cannons to take down the equivalent cost in those guys. So I feel like having literally all the defense all together in one solid mass is kind of intimidating. The amount of firepower that might have taken down a standard size Imperial Knight won't actually stop this guy from functioning at all. Even if the opponent did manage to do some hefty damage to it, if he can still hit back at essentially full damage output, that could be a big swing. Against lower AP things that are shooting it, it might well be able to get a cover save as well, given that they're really easy to get in 10th edition, and it has a 2 plus armor save. If he could get a cover save against things like last cannons, it could be saving on a 4 plus, not a 5. For weaponry, the guns are definitely the main event for this guy. Unlike some of the bigger titans like the Reaver or the Warlord, there's no options for a power fist or anything like that. Instead, this guy tries to step on the enemy with his feet, 8 attacks at strength 10, AP 1 and damage 2, which when hitting on only a 4 plus is perhaps surprisingly tame for being stepped on by a titan. I guess it's perhaps aimed to represent that it might not be all that easy to coordinate stepping on the enemy with those if it's not really designed for it. I still can't help but think that it might have been a bit more fitting that the titan might struggle to hit you, but if you do get stepped on by it, you're going to feel it quite hard. It does mean that if the titan's not screened, then you might be taking the minus one to hit from big guns never tire, even if it can still fire out of combat that way. Being locked up definitely is going to reduce its damage output a fair bit. Then for its actual weaponry though, it gets a ballistic skill of 3+, plus, and it has the choice of 4 different arm weapons, which you can field in any combination. These ones are the Inferno Gun, basically an enormous flamethrower with 3d6 auto hits at 24 inches, strength 7, AP 2 and damage 3. Very punchy for clearing out infantry of all sizes, though it will be kind of sad that it can't overwatch anymore. The Plasma Blast Gun is pretty all round fearsome, a 72 inch range and on the overcharge profile it gets 2d6 plus 3 shots at strength 10, AP 3 and a big damage 5. Very nasty against medium infantry or medium vehicles there. The Turbo Laser Destructor again is 72 inches, D3 plus 3 shots, a big strength 20, AP 3 and damage 2d6, so the optimal one for killing big heavy targets. And finally there's the Warhammer Vulcan Mega Bolter, 20 shots at strength 6, AP minus 1, damage 2 with sustained hits, a longer range option for chewing through hordes or maybe enemy space marines. Looking at the numbers for these, these are how they perform against a range of different targets. The Inferno Gun is unsurprisingly really quite good against infantry, one of the best out there, but unsurprisingly doesn't really do all that much against heavier targets, though it isn't as bad as the Vulcan Mega Bolter. The Plasma Blast Gun is kind of similar against elite infantry like Intercessors and Terminators, and still punches up really quite well against the tougher things just due to the sheer amount of shots it gets, and any wounds through will go through it either damage 4 or 5. The Turbo Laser is significantly weaker against infantry type units, averaging around about 3 Space Marines or almost 2 Terminators, but slightly beats out the Plasma Blast Gun on average against all the hard targets, but the difference maybe isn't quite as big as I might have guessed. I suppose the Plasma Blast Gun isn't actually all that far behind in damage and does get way more shots. Finally, the Vulcan Mega Bolter unfortunately does seem just very weak compared with the rest. It is the best against standard size Space Marines and will beat the others for lighter targets like Hordes a bit better but it's by far the least general purpose, being far worse against things like Terminators compared with the Inferno Gun. Out of these between the numbers, I feel like the Plasma Blast Gun just seems like the most general purpose all-rounder to me, good against literally every target. Though beyond that, I think you could make arguments for either the Inferno Gun or the Turbo Laser if you wanted to skew it to being a bit better against lighter targets or against really heavy stuff. I suppose the Plasma Blast Gun does come with the downside of hazardous rolls if you choose to overcharge, that's probably a price worth paying with near enough the best damage output, both against medium and heavy infantry and hard targets. Otherwise, for its special rules, it gets a fairly hilarious deadly demise of 2d6. If this thing does go down, hopefully it's in the middle of your opponent's army and not in yours, as that could take out entire units with mortal wounds there, at least if you do roll the dreaded 6. Otherwise, it gets a rule called Striding Colossus. Each time you target this model with a stratagem, you must spend twice that stratagem CP cost to do so. So that's going to make it extra painful to use basically any sort of synergy with the core stratagems on the book. Tank Shock probably isn't going to make sense. I suppose it could still perhaps be borderline worth it to maybe re-roll a 2 plus wound roll that you failed on the turbo laser if you had one. Or maybe a saving throw against something that just had massive excessive amounts of damage. Otherwise its special rule maybe just feels not particularly well thought through. As a scout titan it gets a rule called flank speed. 
Each time this model advances, don't make an advanced roll for it. Instead, just add an extra 8 inches to the move characteristic of the model. So I guess that'd have you moving across the board at 22 inches. I feel like in general that's just probably not going to get used all that much though. Particularly if you are playing a somewhat normal size game of Warhammer 40k, this is going to be a massive amount of the points in your army, and you can't really just afford to have it not shoot for a turn. I guess potentially it could allow it to get exactly where it needs to, or redeploy quite quickly, if there's literally nothing out there that it's worth shooting. I guess that could be the case if your opponent's army is just maximally hidden turn 1 or something. Or maybe if you needed a late game burst of speed to get to an objective, you might well be able to rush your opponent's home field objective and contest or score it right on the last turn if that makes more sense than shooting stuff. In general though, I think it'd be rare that you want to pass up the firepower of 1100 points worth of model just to get an extra 8 inch movement on it. I think it is kind of interesting to just have the thought of what this could do in a more normal sized army of 40k though. It would be a bit of a crazy list, just dominated by the Titan and then some support elements. For strength for it, it's just got a huge defensive profile that might be unmanageable for some armies in general. I'd say most competitive armies probably are going to have enough anti-tank to be able to handle this over the course of a game, but there certainly will be some that can't, and then their only option is going to be playing the mission and skirmishing with the rest of your army, and hoping this thing doesn't cause too much impact. I guess if the opponent's firepower is fairly low AP, then you might be able to tow into cover saves fairly easily to get a bit more defence that way. Otherwise, it should be able to reliably hand out big damage to two units each turn, point the two guns at two different things unless there's something big enough to warrant focusing fire. There is quite a lot to be said for just having enormous guns that can be pretty guaranteed to delete certain elements of the opponent's army that are going to be most problematic. If you are going plasma guns and turbo lasers, it might actually be able to kill a similar size points cost in the opponent army over the game if you do have some really big hard targets that rely on good saves to keep them safe. Otherwise, the enormous OC-16 should mean that at least one objective can remain safe, whether it's your home field one or moving it out into the midfield if you can afford to, and good movement should hopefully be able to get it there. Otherwise though, as an enormous model that takes up over half your points at 2,000 points, it realistically does have a whole load of weaknesses on lots of levels. It can only target two targets per turn, and it's not really guaranteed to do that much damage to those. Say for example, whether you take the turbo laser or the plasma blast gun, you don't quite average killing something like a land raider, and you might be killing something around about three terminators, but not exactly wiping a squad if you were splitting fire between two different things. Even if you are pretty guaranteed to kill the targets though, they might just not be all that worth it. If you're using the massive guns to kill, say, 50 or 60 points worth of enemy models at a time, then sure you might destroy the unit, but still not really getting good value out of it. Otherwise, it can take one objective fairly hard, but it can only do the one unless you've got them so bunched up together that it can stand on two. That probably means the army is going to really struggle to score, and of course it's not really going to be helping out much with secondary objectives, particularly ones that might need you to be around the board. The rest of the army is going to have to pick up the slack on that quite hard. Otherwise its damage and defence just really isn't all that great for 1100 points, at least if you weigh that up versus the equivalent models that you could take for that. Say if you're running it in a space marine army you could be taking say 3 gladiator lancers and 3 ballistas dreadnoughts and then still have points left over, they are going to outshoot that against the vast majority of targets. The defence is intimidating, though some armies will definitely have the firepower to take it down, and if and when they do so, you've just lost over half your army, which is probably game losing right there. Otherwise, it doesn't really do much with synergy, as it won't work well with the rest of the army for any other special rules that might affect different units, and stratagems are very inefficient on it. It also won't like terrain all that much, having to move around it, and not being able to just shoot straight through ruins, it certainly could get some of the most important enemy units hiding until they get to strike, or they can do objective things. Overall, it does just feel beatable on two different levels. If your opponent's got the anti-tank to destroy it, then that's probably going to be a game win there. If they don't, they might still have the objective scoring and guerrilla warfare sort of tricks to outplay it and get more points overall. I still think the idea of trying to run one of these and support it with other units will be quite fun though. I think most critically, if you're spending 1,100 points on a single model, you need lots and lots of cheap objective support to back it up, things that can get board control and contest other points on the map, perhaps cheap units to hold down the home field and move into the midfield as trading units, and other fast movers or reserve type units that can do secondary objectives around the board, or potentially screen the Titan from something that's going to kill it, either stopping heavy hitting enemy deep strikers landing right next to it, or perhaps a big charge threat that might seriously threaten it's like Angron coming hurtling in from just charging and destroying your model. 
Otherwise, I guess a little bit of indirect fire might help a bit against the things that the Titan won't be able to reach. A bunch of units that could threaten enemy infantry a bit better than the Titan can seem sensible, given that units that deal with hordes quite well tend to be fairly cheap, but the Titan won't do that well at all. And I guess you could go for a little bit of saturation overload if you can do the rest with still having some fairly tough tanky profiles. That might help divert other enemy anti-tank fire so not literally everything goes into the Titan, or supporting elements get ignored. Overall, I guess maybe Guard could be a fairly good supporting force, perhaps some Kastchan jungle fighters in Chimeras for annoying objective skirmishers and actually being okay against infantry. You could use a bit of Ignore's line of sight as well. Perhaps this is a battle with all the very cheap chaff units and a little bit of armour that they can access, they could have exorcists too. And I guess you could make some good use of allied units like Inquisitorial Henchmen, Calidus Assassins or Nurglings if you're Chaos and have them help out with board control or doing secondary objectives and primary objectives for the options that have some OC. Overall, realistically, between all that, they're just not really considered competitive. Too much of an investment in a single unit that has a lot of ways of the opponents to play it round and just ultimately isn't really all that efficient. I'm sure it won't stop people who have one from using them from time to time though, just to see what it does and if they can get any surprise results with it. I feel like in general if you want a big stompy robot to add to an army though, you might be better off with something like Imperial Knight, Canis Rex, or Castellan Knights, or Knight Tyrants for the Chaos. And it's not like those guys are considered particularly competitive in themselves, though they do seem to be more efficient than Mr. Warhound. In general though, I feel like that's probably Games Workshop's intent to keep it that way. They probably don't want every single optimised army list to be including a Titan. It would make for a pretty depressing competitive game. I feel like they perhaps point them at a points level where they're not really going to be enormously efficient, but are more just some big fun crazy models with some big stats, more focused on big fun lore focused games rather than the competitive scene or anything. In any case, let me know your thoughts on the Warhound Titan down in the comments below. Look forward to hearing your thoughts and ideas, and if you've seen any of these in-game in 10th in edition so far. If you've enjoyed the video, then feel free to subscribe to All Specs Tactics. I'll certainly keep the regular 40k videos coming. I do tend to post new ones just about every day. Finally, if you have been enjoying all the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that All Specs Tactics does have a Patreon page as well, and you can find that linked in the video description if you'd like to help support. Channel patrons do get a fair few advantages, seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things happen next on the channel, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways with a chance to win some big model kits each month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.